Hi, I'm Rob Young, and uh, I wrote the story of Can called All Gates Open, which is a biography of the band, um, and uh, which also features uh, text by the keyboardist of the band, Ermin Schmidt, kind of a selection of interviews and diaries that he's kept. And I had the amazing job of being able to write the history of probably my favorite band, I'd say, of all time, if, if I got uh, pushed to the edge of a cliff. I've just been in Rough Trade East, and I picked out six albums that are, well, some of them are by Can, some of them are, have connections to Can in different ways, and um, I'll try and explain a little bit why I made those choices. Okay, here's the first choice. Um, it's Soul Jazz Records presents Deutsche Elektronische Musik, and it's a compilation um, put together by the Soul Jazz label of some German music from this, roughly the same period that Can were in existence. Um, it's not exactly a, it's, it's, not, it's not entirely a beginner's uh, guide to kraut rock, but it would be not a bad place to start if you've never heard any German music from that period. Um, it actually kicks off with a can track. Um, it's not a not not the obvious choice either. Quite an interesting one. Um, a spectacle or a spectacle from the late 70s. This was um, the theme tune of a German current affairs program, which they developed into a into a separate track. Um, I think that probably gives you the message that it's not going to be a totally conventional uh, compilation here. But it's got some great names: Harmonia. Um, you've got Popol Vu, Konrad Schnitzler, uh, Faust and Neu. They're kind of quite recognizable names if you know something about Krautrock. But there's also some real obscurities here. I mean, I haven't heard anything by uh, Mikhail Bunt or Collective. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's an, it's an interesting uh, collection of stuff. And I think it's the first in a, in a series of compilations as well. So. This is, a, this is an interesting place to start with, with kraut rock and um, the kind of more experimental side of, of German music in the 70s, which, which, in a, which can really are kind of at the forefront of in so many ways. Well, for the choices of uh, can albums, I had to go a little bit with um, what was in stock in Rough Trade today. And um, so of the earliest uh, can recordings, I picked this one, Delay 1968. It's the first stuff can really properly recorded, although this album didn't actually come out till the early 80s. Um, so it kind of filled in a, a kind of bl blank spot in Cannes history. Um, but it's really powerful stuff recorded in the first studio they had in this castle outside of Cologne in Germany. Uh, it's with their first vocalist, uh, an American guy called Malcolm Mooney, uh, who was um, sort of an amazing addition to this band which was full of people coming from contemporary music and free jazz. Uh, this American guy kind of just joined the group uh, spontaneously and uh, was this most incredible vocalist and improvising lyrics. Um, so this, this is kind of, it's quite kind of garage rock in flavor. Um, it's very, it's quite rough, the recordings, but I really like that. Uh, you really get a sense of the place, this kind of very intense um, rehearsal space that they, that they lived in, covered with um, soundproofing and lots of uh, crazy gizmos to help them record, and just recorded on a, on a two-track tape recorder, as most of their stuff was in the early years. So um, this was one that really uh, excited me when I first picked it up, when I first started listening to Can, uh, and it's got some real um, memorable tracks on it. Um, this track here, Thief, uh, sometimes gets covered by Radiohead when they play live, so it's a good, good example of how Cannes music is picked up by more contemporary people. This is the next Cannes album I picked out, Soundtracks from 1970, and this um, was a collection of some of the music which Cannes made for film, uh, different films very early on in their career. It's pretty much thanks to the fact that they got commissioned to do film and TV soundtracks that they could continue as a band because that's where they earned most of their money in their first two or three years. So this did really reflect um, a big part of Cannes' work at the time. It's, uh, it's a collection of, of tracks that mark both the first vocalist, Malcolm Mooney, and also their new one, Damo Suzuki, this incredible Japanese uh, busker 
who they met with quite randomly in Munich in 1970 and just invited into the band. And immediately he took his place and um, really uh, helped them make some of their most well-remembered music. Um, and uh, some of the earliest things that he did with them is on here, uh, like this track, T Don't Turn the Light On, Leave Me Alone. Um, it's also got a real can classic on here, Mother Sky, which is um, 14 minutes of this incredible driving hypnotic groove. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great album, it's a quite, quite sort of uh, showcases more of the kind of songwriting side of Can in some ways, uh, this album. I tried to track down all the movies that they, that they made music for when I was writing my book and it's quite a strange bunch of films uh, when you actually see them today. Um, kind of German spaghetti westerns and weird sci-fi movies and and uh, kind of almost like soft porn movies so it's, <laughs> it's an interesting reflection of German culture at the time to see those films um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great illustration of a lot of different sides of Cannes, this album. Okay so if they happened to have uh, Targo Margo in stock today I would have probably chosen that but they'd sold out so um, but I was very happy to choose this one from 1973, Cannes Future Days. I think actually after working on the book and listening to lots of Cannes music for several years, this is actually the one that really, uh, I think I, I would conclude this is the ultimate Cannes album. Uh, for me, it's kind of just, uh, the, the group is really at this beautiful kind of streamlined point in its development. The title track is a beautiful, quite melancholy um, glide. Uh, just featuring fantastic synth sounds and um, uh, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful record. It's kind of almost like symphonic the way it's got three, three tracks on side one, like three movements. And then it's got this massive uh, nearly 20 minute track on, on side B called Bel Air, which is again in, almost like in three movements. Um, but it just shows Can's kind of almost telepathic play together so well you can almost hear them kind of trying to sort of merge everything they did in in the studio listening to what was in each other's heads um, and sometimes you even see it kind of fraying at the edges a little bit and then tightening back up again and it's just um, it's one to it's definitely one for the headphones and it's definitely one to spend a lot of time uh, swimming in but um, it's a really it's a really superb record and you know even now after several years of, of listening to this and in fact all, all cans music I'm still not really tired of it I could still happily sit down and, and listen to this all the way through again so um, I was looking for some music that came after can to sort of illustrate how how their influence has uh, filtered out in into the world since they split up in 1978 and I couldn't resist this one it's the fall this nation's saving grace from 1985 um, and I bought this at the time when it came out I was hearing the fall on the John Peel show on uh, Radio 1 um, and uh, probably heard a radio session from them at the time it's actually on here so this is a special edition um, which has uh, some, some uh, recordings made for John Peel, so that was probably it. Um, but this is the original record, uh, amazing, amazing record. Um, I mean, the, the great thing about this is that uh, on side two it has this track called I Am Damo Suzuki, which obviously is a tribute to Can Singer. Um, I didn't know who Damo Suzuki was when I bought this album, and you know you couldn't google people in those days <laughs> there was no such thing so I didn't really kind of try to investigate who that was I just assumed it was a, a name that Marky e. Smith had made up uh, but now I can hear I play that track and I can hear that it's uh, he's referencing um, can and uh, sort of Damo's lyrics <coughs> in what he sings and also the the chords that they use in this are it's a kind of sequence of chords that can often used in several different tracks of their own. So it's very much a, it's a quite sort of messy post-punk can homage, but it's great. But the rest of this album is fantastic as well. Um, and uh, what I found out also was that uh, Mark E. Smith had phoned up the can office uh, in 1979, um, asking, almost begging <laughs> them to come and play 
a tour with, with the Fool. He had this idea that the Fool and Can could do sets and then they would join together and do an improvisation at the end. What an amazing event that would have been to see. If he'd rung up a year earlier, that probably would have happened. But by the time he actually made contact, Can had split up. So that was uh, one of the great events that never happened. And finally, uh, so this is an album I haven't actually heard myself. I just discovered it in the racks just now, um, but this looks brilliant. It's LCD Sound System, um, and it's not one of the sort of official albums. It's uh, Sessions, London Sessions. And um, I mean, the photos on the front are brilliant. And there, there are photos of Can in their own studio that look really like this. So already there's a connection. But I mean, when I saw this band live in 2004, it just blew me away so much. It was one of the best live experiences I've ever had. And in a way, I feel like it's one of the closest things you could get to actually seeing Can live now would be to see there's a few, a few bands, but LCD Sound System were definitely one of them. They sort of had the similar elements, a kind of very monotonous, repetitious rhythm section, um, kind of pretty uh, frenetic vocals, and um, you know, almost a kind of self-consciousness about what they were doing as well, which just about came through, but it was also incredibly passionate. Um, James Murphy from the band, of course, also is uh, very much out there as a massive Can fan. He very often got photographed wearing a Future Days t-shirt at the height of the, the band's um, success. And, um, you know, he's a sort of a kindred spirit, I would say, to Can. Um, I actually saw them play in a Rough Trade in store not long afterwards as well. It was, it was when the Rough Trade had, had the shop in Covent Garden. It was a really tiny little basement and we were practically kind of in in the face of the band and it was uh, also a fantastic uh, thing to be at. So I have a lot of great memories connected with LCD Sound System and I, I feel like they've, they're one of the few bands that are in, kind of claim to be influenced by Can and actually are sort of worthy of that claim. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to listening to this. I think it's going to be probably just about as raw as that Can Delay 1968 album.